Welcome to the third in a series of genome technology development webinars hosted by the Genome TDCC. Um, I'm Mark Adams. I'm the principal investigator for this award, which is a coordinating center for NHGRI's genome technology development programs. We span about 65 grants that are funded as part of the NHGRI portfolio in the areas of nucleic acid sequencing, nucleic acid synthesis, single molecule protein sequencing, and a broad range of genome technologies for understanding the structure, function, and activity of the genome. We serve to facilitate collaborations, and most importantly, perhaps, help get the word out about new advances in the fields that our PIs work on. The series this month is part of that effort to uh, reach out to folks in the scientific community with information that's hopefully relevant and topical and to help you understand some of these advances. Um, this is the third uh, in the series. Two sessions from last week will be available on our YouTube channel by the end of this week. And if you're interested in the in hearing one more from us this week on a Thursday afternoon, we have a genome scale regulatory analysis webinar coming up. Today, the topic is advances in single cell analysis. We have three terrific speakers. Uh, two of them are from the GT, uh, the TDCC program, and a special guest from the Jackson Lab. Uh, Elise Courtois, who leads our single cell biology group. I'll introduce them as we go through. Please enter your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom. We won't take questions until the end, but go ahead and as you think of them, write them down. And uh, at the end of the session, we'll uh, have an open Q&A session leading off with those questions. Our first speaker today is uh, Aaron Streets. He is Associate Professor of Bioengineering at UC Berkeley. He's one of those fascinating individuals who started out in physics, PhD in physics from Stanford, uh, and after a postdoc at uh, Beijing University and at Berkeley, he joined the faculty there, and his lab really combines math, physics, and engineering approaches to try to understand particularly complex systems and aspects of biological systems. So, Aaron, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Okay. Thanks so much, Mark. Hello, everybody out there. Um, so, as Mark said, I'm at UC Berkeley. I'm in the computational biology program, the bioengineering program, and the biophysics program. And students from my lab uh, come from all three of these programs. It's a very interdisciplinary group. Um, today's talk is going to be an overview uh, of single cell genomic analysis. So, it's really meant to be an introduction. If you do any single cell analysis in your research, most of this will be familiar to you. Um, some of this work is ours, but uh, a vast majority of it is not. And so this is supposed to be a, a, a review for people who haven't done a lot of single cell analysis. Okay. So one second here. So our body is composed of uh, trillions of cells, each of which has essentially two copies of the same genome, our genome but each of which has an incredibly and vastly different molecular composition. They live in different places. The cells have different functions. And if we can measure um, biological systems at the single cell level, then we can not only understand the sort of molecular mechanisms that give rise to cellular phenotype and function, but then we can also begin to use single cell analysis as a way to look at how uh, changes in cellular composition um, react from perturbations such as uh, disease, development, and aging, or, or even drug treatments. And so much of single cell uh, analysis boils down to a handful of questions. We want to be able to figure out uh, what is the cellular type, what type of cell we're looking at um, in high throughput. And by type, I mean anything from state to function to phenotype, um, what it looks like, morphological qualities. We want to be able to measure that type and high throughput so that we can begin to quantify cellular frequency or composition. How many of CD4 T cells do we have in response to a drug treatment? And we might want to also be able to figure out where those cells are. And for the most part, um, when we make single cell measurements on, on their location, on, on where the niche of a cell is, we get that with uh, with relatively low resolution by sampling specific biopsies and then knowing which tissue we're looking at. So the question then becomes, how do we quantify 
the identity uh, of a cell. There are many different ways to identify a cell. Um, we can measure any number of molecules from any one of these layers of sort of molecular type. And many of these molecules we've measured since the history of, of single cell analysis. We can measure many of the proteins or metabolites with, with microscopy and optical measurements. And of course, um, some, of these, some of these molecules we measure with DNA sequencing. So the first single cell analysis tool, the microscope, allows us to use anything from fluorescence measurements to even bright field measurements, um, like this right stain here of these uh, chronic myelomonocytic leukemia cells. And here you can see, just because of the, this is a peripheral blood film, uh, that's, which is a right stain, and you can see the, the sort of chromatin smear in these um, myelocytes and metamyelocytes. And so by counting the number of these cells undergoing monocytosis and looking at the relative proportion of red blood cells in the background, you could uh, identify cell type and potentially uh, diagnose disease. This is just a bright field image. Of course, uh, with more sophisticated single cell analysis techniques like flow cytometry, we can label the cert, we can stain the surface of cells with antibodies to specific proteins. And if those antibodies are connected to a flu uh, fluorophore, then we can make quantitative measurements on the types of cells by gating on a host of different surface markers and cataloging uh, the, the frequency or the composition of, of in this case, CD, um, CD3 positive T cells. And so we're able to discern CD4 and CD8 T cells at various states with flow cytometry. So while uh, optical measurements are incredibly powerful, not only for high sensitivity measurement of the composition of molecules in the cell and the, the morphology of cells, the locations of chemicals and molecules within the cell, um, optical measurements have a limited bandwidth, meaning that there's only so many unique molecules that we can measure simultaneously because of the uh, finite bandwidth of, of the, the fluorescent spectrum or the visible spectrum. And so when we want to make characteristics, we want to characterize a cell on some of these layers that have genome sort of wide scale. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of different prote proteins and proteoforms, tens of thousands of different genes, you know, billions of base pairs. Um, then we need to go to a different technique. And, and, and this is where uh, high throughput DNA sequencing comes in. If we can convert the identity of these molecules into DNA, then we can use a DNA sequencer, which is essentially a uh, high throughput multiplex microscope um, to count the number of molecules uh, on a genome wide scale. And so with DNA sequencing, we can catalog uh, millions to billions of molecules in a single experiment. And in this, if we can convert these molecules into DNA, then we can make, then we can quantify cellular identity with sequencing. And one of the most popular and, and the most powerful techniques for this these days is by doing single cell RNA sequencing. And measuring the transcriptome. Well, the way that we do that is we take uh, all the mRNA out of cells, we reverse transcribe that mRNA into uh, cDNA, then we synthesize the second strand and we can sequence that DNA on a DNA sequencer. Um, each one of the reads from that from those cDNA, cDNA we map back to a reference genome, and so the read count or the number of reads that we get that map to a particular gene ends up being the a proxy for for gene expression. And so if we can perform this measurement uh, on single cells, then we can get thousands of, of measurements of the abundance of transcripts for different genes, and we get a very quantitative measurement of the identity of that cell. Um, and I think a lot of people like to think of, of RNA sequencing as a, a proxy for protein abundance, which is a functional molecule of the cell. But, but in some cases, uh, we just like to think of RNA measurements as sort of the regulatory state of that cell. There might be some, some correlation, and in some cases there might be some lack of correlation between transcript abundance and proteins, but this gives you a quantitative state of which genes are being, a quantitative measure of which genes are being expressed. So the hard thing about single cell RNA sequencing isn't the sequencing part. Uh, we have many techniques of doing high throughput cDNA conversion and, and sequencing and library preparation. The hard part about single cell RNA sequencing is a single cell part. How do we take a cell that's you know, 10 microns wide and put it into a tube and perform those molecular reactions necessary 
uh, to put that library onto a sequencer. And not only how do we do that once, but how do we do it enough times to get enough data so, so we can get a, a relatively powerful comp, uh, compositional characterization of a tissue or, or even an organism? Well, despite this, this challenge, uh, the number of cells that have been reported per experiment over the past decade has increased exponentially. This is a beautiful review by Valentine Svensson and Leo Pachter cataloging um, sort of a Moore's law for the throughput of single cell RNA sequencing over the past decade. And for those of you engineers in the audience, anytime you see a sort of a linear um, or, or a, a linear slope in a, in a logarithmic scale, we know that there's some sort of technological boom that's catalyzing the increase in throughput, just like we have with um, information technology. So in a review that I wrote with uh, Dr. Yenny Huang and Jianbing Wang and Angela Wu, we, we investigated this inflection point of throughput in, in single cell RNA sequencing experiments to, to really highlight the fact that um, it was sort of the marriage of molecular barcoding strategies and micro devices that really allowed uh, scientists to go from picking single cells and putting them into a tube to measuring hundreds to thousands to even uh, tens of thousands of cells in a single experiment. And so here I'm just listing a couple of uh, microfluidics or micro device platforms that allowed for high throughput single cell analysis. And, and many of these technologies over the years have really increased the throughput, the number of cells per experiment, but have also uh, made significant strides in increasing the sensitivity of these measurements. So the number of genes that we can detect per cell, or really the number of um, genes that we can detect uh, per dollar as well. So it's very similar to the sort of Moore's law um, exponential growth. And these technologies span a range of, of sort of fluid handling, molecular barcoding and micro device strategies. And I won't review all of them, but essentially we have everything from integrated microfluidics um, to flow sorting, fact sorting robots or liquid handling robots that can place cells into wells at high throughput to more sophisticated micro devices that allow you to barcode cells. And I'll explain more about what that means. But in addition to this sort of technological advance over the past uh, decade, there's also been a more recent uh, pushed not only to measure the transcriptome of single cells in high throughput, but also to start to measure other aspects of single cells with the same throughput as single cell RNA sequencing. So now if we can convert uh, epigenetic uh, states like chromatin accessibility um, or protein DNA binding, or if we can convert molecules like proteins into a DNA signature and convert that into a sequencing measurement, we can begin to capture many layers of cellular identity with the throughput that we can uh, we can with single cell RNA sequencing. Of course, in parallel with this sort of hardware development has been an incredible amount of software development to figure out how we can take these large multi-dimensional data sets that we can never hope to visualize with our with our own um, with our own brain, and reduce this, these high dimensional data sets into lower dimensional data sets so that not only we can understand the relationships of different cells as measured by many different molecular me measurements, but also so that we can begin to understand the relationship between the molecules in different cell types. How do uh, sort of chromatin state relate to gene expression, relates to protein abundance and so forth. So in the last couple of slides, I'm just gonna briefly review how we can begin to take these uh, multi-omic measurements and high throughput. And I think sort of one of the seminal um, uh, developments th that coincided with the introduction of microfluidic devices for single cell RNA sequencing um, is this notion of, of a barcoded bead or barcoding single cells um, for multiplex library preparation and sequencing. So this is sort of a cartoon of how it works. But in short, there's a, a bead, a, a, a micron scale solid phase or, or hydrogel bead which has um, DNA molecules, which are capture primers. So these are, these are probes which can capture um, mRNA with, this, with a poly A tail. And on that DNA molecule is a PCR primer, a cell barcode, which is a unique DNA sequence that is specific to this bead. So every molecule on this bead has the same cell barcode. It's, it can be anywhere from 10 to 20 base pairs long, and it's, it's predefined um, 
and it's unique. And then there's also this unique molecular identifier, which is another sequence of, of, of base pairs, but this, this sequence is random. So every molecule uh, on this bead has a different UMI. So if you can if you can associate a cell's mRNA with this bead, you can capture that mRNA. You can reverse transcribe the mRNA to cDNA, which now has uh, all of these barcodes on it, and you can use PCR to amplify the cDNA from that cell, and you can sequence it. And this allows you. And if you can do this uh, to many cells at a time, you can get these cDNA libraries where every cDNA from every cell has a unique cell barcode and cDNA from every transcript has a unique molecular identifier. So how can we get single cells matched up with single beads? Uh, one of the most popular ways to do it, at least because of, the, um, uh, because of access to some commercial machines, is a microfluidic device called a droplet generator. So here, what you're looking at is a microfluidic device. These channels are about 100 microns wide. And you, in, in two of these channels, you inject oil. And in this channel in the middle here, you inject single cells, barcoded beads, and, and, uh, and reverse transcription reagents. And then you pressurize these inlets, and you can create thousands of droplets inside one of these devices, one of these devices. And so this is a, a device that we made, but this is also the inside of a, the 10X chromium controller, for example. This strategy was developed uh, also in 2014. It was called Indrop or DropSeq. Uh, uh, by Klein and McCasco um, at the same time, but there's been a lot of development since. And so the idea is if you can put cells and beads into these droplets at a low enough concentration that you have a chance of pairing one cell with one bead in every 10 or 100 droplets, then you can make thousands or hundreds of thousands of droplets and successfully barcode these individual cells or the, the mRNA from individual cells with unique DNA barcodes. So then you can put all of the, the cDNA, you can, you, if you can barcode the mRNA from each cell, lyse the cell, barcode the mRNA, and break these emulsions and put all of the cDNA together, you can make a single library. And that single library will have transcripts from on the order of tens of thousands of cells uh, depending on how much money you spend and how much time you have. So now you're left with this huge data set, which is uh, you know tens of thousands of cells by tens of thousands of genes. And if you're able to use sort of newer multiomic techniques that allow you to also measure hundreds of proteins, this is SiteSeq, uh, a method that was developed by Martin Smyber, uh, Peter Smybert and Rolf Satija in 2017, now you have this huge data set that has tens of thousands of cells, tens of thousands of genes, hundreds of proteins, and we can't begin to use, we can't use these sort of biaxial plots anymore. And so instead we need new computational techniques to take this high dimensional data, reduce it down to, to low dimensional uh, data so that we can interpret it. And uh, there's many tools uh, for doing this kind of large, High, uh, high dimensional data processing. Um, Surat is a, a, a very popular one that you'll hear more about in, in a couple um, in a couple slides. But one of the tools that we developed is called Total VI, and this is a tool that's part of the SCVI um, uh, a toolkit. And essentially, the idea is that these huge data sets are sparse. You don't need uh, tens of thousands by tens of thousands by hundreds of variables to to, can, to encode all of the information. And so um, the idea is this variational autoencoder generates uh, a lower dimensional latent space that can encode a majority of the information if we make some assumptions about the, the statistical distribution of the gene counts and the protein counts. And so I won't go through the, the math for this uh, uh, analytical technique, but the idea here is that in this 20 lower dimensional latent space, we can now identify cell types and remove batch effects, noise effects, and background, and begin to look at cell types on a lower dimensional space. So that you'll see a lot of these U maps in the next few slides, in, in the next few talks. And these are two dimensional plots in which each dot is a cell, and its position on this two dimensional axis represents its gene expression profile and potentially its surface protein abundance. And then using, uh, you know known markers, you can identify cell types and look at the compositional changes in, in, um, 
as a response to perturbations. And so what you want with these techniques is the ability to not only identify subpopulations, but also to look at phenotypic gradients. So for each one of these cells, we have both gene expression and protein abundance. And we can also begin to do differential expression between different cell types. And so that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? Um, we have, now we have tools that can collect gene expression profiles and epigenetic state, uh, chromatin accessibility, surface protein abundance from thousands of cells, tens of thousands of cells at a time. And we can now begin to think about generating a human cell atlas, a reference atlas of all the healthy cell types in the, uh, in the human body. And the question becomes, if we have trillions of cells in our body and hundreds to thousands of different states that we might want to probe, how can we do this faster? How can we do this cheaper? And how can we do this in such a way that we can retain the spatial location of those cells that we're interested in? And so with that, I'll pass this on to my colleagues so they can tell you more about some of the state of the art. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Aaron. The next speaker is Beth Martin, who is going to pick up where Aaron left off. Uh, Beth is a research scientist at University of Washington. She's worked with Jay Shinduri for many years. Uh, all of the things that you know about Jay and the fantastic contributions he's made to approaches for studying the genome and um, development and implications, Beth's had a hand in all of those things. So she's going to walk us through some of the details of, uh, of one of the recent projects. Take it away, Beth. Hi everyone, my name is Beth Martin and I am a research scientist in Jay Chandray's lab at the University of Washington. So thanks to the Genome Tech Dev Coordinating Center for letting me share our work today. Um, I'll be introducing you to our method for single cell transcriptional profiling using combinatorial indexing and some of the optimizations that we made to allow us to create an extremely detailed 12 million cell atlas of mouse development from embryonic day eight all the way to birth. Okay, there we go. Um, our goal when we began this endeavor was to simply expand on the original mouse atlas MOCA from my former lab mate, Jun Wei Tao and Malta Spielman. Uh, June is now an assistant professor at Rockefeller, and Malta is the head of the Institute of Human Genetics at the University of Lubeck. Um, that first atlas detailed mouse organogenesis from E9.5 through E13.5 with 2 million cells. But in that data set, the time points were roughly staged, and for this experiment, we wanted to be more thorough with closer windows with more exact staging. Since even in the same litter, siblings can be days apart in development. So why do, we, why do we want to do this? Um, mice share almost all of their genes with humans and make an excellent model organism for human physiology and disease. And so we wanted to create a detailed framework, framework of mouse development uh, to construct a resource with smooth, continuous trajectories that could be used to inter interrogate the distinct pathways that create each cell type in the adult organism. So to get the level of fine resolution that we wanted, mouse embryos were staged not just by age, but by morphological features using both manual curation of landmarks and automatic staging by limb bud formation with CMOS, uh, with some amazing contributions from Ian Welsh and Steve Murray of Jackson Lab. We had um, hundreds of meticulously staged mouse embryos to choose from, enabling us to take snapshots of the transcriptome in six hour Six hour time window uh, from E8 all the way through birth, greatly expanding upon the previous atlas. So, meanwhile, as these embryos were being selected, we were optimizing the CYRNC protocol that had been developed by Junyue Jun Tao in our lab. Um, this method uses the power of combinatorial indexing to create unique barcodes to link transcripts to individual cells. It is open source and can be scaled exponentially simply by increasing the number of indexes used in each round. Um, nuclei are first isolated from the sample or sample, uh, fixed and distributed to one or more 96 well plates to reverse transcribe the RNA and add an index specific sequence to that well. And each well starts off with probably like 10,000 um, cells per well or nuclei per well. Uh, this first plate can be divided among multiple samples, and the well index will connect the transcripts back to that sample. And then after reverse transcription, the cells are pooled and distributed randomly to a second plate to ligate, 
leg it on a second index sequence. And then they are pulled and redistributed again into a third plate where the nuclei and their transcripts undergo second strand synthesis, segmentation by TN5, and then finally PCR, which will add both a third index specific to that well and also a plate index. Um, you can have one plate of indexing for each round, or you can scale it up to four or more plates at each round, which will enable you to get over 1 million cells per experiment. You are truly only limited by the amount of sequencing that you'd like to pay for. And I know this sounds incredibly complicated if you haven't done this before, but I can tell you that the combinatorial indexing section of this protocol is actually the easy part. Um, let me tell you about some of the challenges in just getting the cells and nuclei into that first reverse transcription plate with their RNA intact and how we solve those challenges. So why do we use nuclei? So June had a very clever method for dissociating whole mouse embryos into single cells, which is to just not use cells at all. Um, by simply mincing or pulverizing tissues into a lysis buffer that's gentle enough to keep the nuclei intact, you can then simply run the free nuclei over a 40 micron cell strainer and strain out the majority of the debris. So you can see the tube on the, the right has a nice pellet of clean nuclei. Um, also, by using nuclei, you are not reliant on freshly harvested tissues. Uh, they can be snap frozen and banked for later, a process that would damage whole cells. So let me show you why snap freezing is important. So our new atlas tracks mouse development in precisely staged six hour increments. Um, for the earliest time point, we have even have two hour increments during somatogenesis with an embryo representing each addition of a single somite from zero to 34 somite. And then at birth, we have a time series of 20 minute increments after C-section. So this final series at birth pointed to some dramatic transitions in gene expression, particularly in hepatocytes, adipocytes, and alveolar cells in the lung. And it makes sense since these tissues have fundamental roles to play in adapting to living outside the womb, but it was really striking like how quickly it happened and that we were able to catch this quick shift. So now we can only have these precise timings if we are able to quickly store the samples before processing them. That breathing allows us much more freedom of sample collection because we can bank samples for later experiment since we are not worried about whole cell integrity. We can simply use nuclei. So as mentioned earlier, our previous atlas only spans the time points between E9.5 and E13.5. Um, why couldn't we go earlier than this? Um, so brand new embryos are, that are eight days old are really only about two to three millimeters in length, containing around 200,000 cells. And normally for samples this size, it is necessary to pool many of them in order to have enough cells to make it through a single cell protocol. And with the previous iteration of the SkyNA63 protocol, there's a significant loss of nuclei as they travel through all the washes, through the steps, making it really unrealistic to harvest and pool the, number, number, the numbers of embryos needed. So, um, in conjunction with some of the other optimizations that I'll go into later, we developed Tiny Sky, which uses a one pot strategy to lyse cells and fix nuclei, minimizing the transfers that lose cells to the insides of the tips in the tube. An individual embryo is snap frozen in a microfuge tube, and a circle is drawn around the embryo to make it easier to spot later. Um, the embryo is lysed and fixed in that exact same tube, then put directly into several wells of the index reverse transcription. And then multiple tiny embryos can also be distributed and indexed in that same plate in different wells. And then the index will tie it back to that particular sample. So because we were able to index on individual tiny samples, our time series of embryos at one somite increment has an incredible amount of fine resolution that would have been difficult to match with cool samples. So here we have a subset of progenitor cells that get colored by their somite count with a clear progression as the somites are added. Okay, so tiny sky takes care of the early embryos, but what's the deal with the embryos that are older than E13 and a half? So June's original mouse, mouse atlas had an upper limit of developmental age because samples over the age of E13 and a half consistently failed in the sky RNAC protocol. And not only did they fail, but they had the unfortunate bonus effect of taking out previously working samples with them, making them fail too. 
So we suspected it was due to the endogenous RNases in the older sample, despite throwing buckets of expensive RNase inhibitors at them. So we looked for ways to investigate and remedy this. So anybody who has worked with RNA has experienced the paranoia of contaminating RNases that destroy RNA. It's all over our hands, therefore it's all over our benches, probably in our reagents, we just feel like we can't clean enough. But I can tell you that most of the problem RNases that you're gonna run into are actually coming from the tissue that you are working with. So another reason that being able to free samples is important uh, is that you can stop the RNA degradation from happening before you have a chance to deal with it. So IDT makes a simple test for RNA since it's not a paid promotion, but um, it consists of an RNA oligo with the fluorophore on one end and a quencher on the other. So if RNA is present, this oligo is cleaved and you get fluorescence. So I cannot tell you how much this simple assay has benefited our experiment. It provides just a quick, simple check to see if the sample will work at all before we waste expensive reagents on it. But more importantly, it told us A, why our older samples, samples were failing, and that B, of that our expensive RNA inhibitors were not actually doing anything at all. So um, in this photo of the RNA alert test on the nuclei of an E13 and half mouse, we can see clearly that the tubes with inhibitors like superacin or protector look a whole lot like the tube with no inhibitor at all. So in contrast, the tube with uh, DEV, DEPC or diethyl pyrocarbonate shows no RNA activity. So DEPC is commonly used to produce RNA free reagents in the lab by altering the RNA's protein itself. Could we simply just add DEPC to our lysis buffer? Would it affect downstream enzymatic reaction? Um, long story short, yes, we can add it, and no, it doesn't interfere. In fact, by switching to DEPC as an RNA inhibitor and changing the buffer to accommodate it, we are now able to profile nuclei, nuclei from mice of any age, which enabled us to span our atlas to birth and maybe beyond. Um, also, DEPC is so much cheaper than the proprietary inhibitors. So other optimizations that Optimizations that we did, uh, we changed the main buffer to one that enables better recovery of the nuclei during, during washing and spins. It has sucrose to cushion and protect the nuclei. PBS, Triton X100, which helps to pellet the nuclei during washing. You can see in the picture a nice pellet of nuclei. Without it, the nuclei tend to remain floating in the supernatant and then they get lost that way. Um, and it also has some magnesium chloride for nuclear integrity. Another change that really helped boost our UMI counts per cell was to add a simple protease step after distributing to the third plate. And um, it really helped make the cDNA accessible to the TN5 transposase. Uh, these photos show the nuclei disintegrating, releasing the wisps of DNA and cDNA. Um, and because we got better nuclei recovery with the new buffer, we were able to drop the reaction cell volumes down significantly and lower the total number of cells needed to start. We usually start with about 2 million cells per plate. Uh, we also removed an unnecessary user step. And another time and tip saver was removing the need for a 96 well supply cleanup step, which if you've ever had to do that, you know how nice it is to not have to do that step. Um, in the end, we have a reliable, complex, but simple, protocol where you can get about 1 million cells for about $3,200 in reagents to make the sequencing library in two to three days. The most con time consuming part of this whole thing is the sample collection and staging, which would be similar for any single cell protocol. The most expensive part is the sequencing. So, and then for this project, we ended up with 12 million cells with a median count of 25 unique transcripts per cell, um, 2,500. And, um, and providing which is which kind of ends up with what is essentially a time lapse of mouse development. And even though this is a huge data set, the bulk of the work was able to be performed by just a few of us. That's how powerful combinatorial indexing is. So with that, I'd like to give a particular shout out to my partner in the Shendere lab, Cheng Xian Chu, and who did a phenomenal job with all of the analysis in the paper and was able to wrangle every novice son that I threw at him. 
Uh, Ian Welsh of the Jackson Lab for painstaking and staging hundreds of embryos for us, and all of our other co-authors and lab mates for their valuable insights, and of course, Jay Chandray for letting me try new things all the time. I'd also like to thank our supporting institutions and our union, UW Research Researchers United, uh, who are still fighting for our first contract. And if you'd like to check out our papers, here are the references for the Big Mouse Atlas and for the Optimized Protocol. And I thank the audience for letting me share our project with you all. I'm happy to take some questions at the end. Thank you very much, Beth. It's great to see so many of the little things that come together to make an experiment work and the different challenges across uh, the developmental time frame that went into that. Um, we'll continue the, the biological story. Um, Elise is going to tell us a little bit about the work that she's doing as part of her research program. She also leads the single cell biology lab at the Jackson Laboratory. This is a scientific service that supports all investigators here and at the University of Connecticut and access to a wide variety of tech these technologies. So Elise, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Hello, thank you for having me. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I'm very excited today to show you how we can actually use those very cool technologies such as single cell assays to uh, address a very complex and heterogeneous disease that is endometriosis and, and learn a little bit more about the microenvironment uh, in this disease. So for those who don't know what endometriosis is, it's uh, a disease that is very common. It impacts uh, about 190 million individuals worldwide and uh, has a huge economical uh, impact in the in the population estimated at $78 billion for the US only each year. But most importantly, endometriosis has no cure or no uh, effective or definitive treatment. And uh, the the, the diagnosis uh, on average takes about seven to 10 years and is usually um, um, happening at around, about 27 years old, so very young for the patients. And endometriosis is a, is a complex, it's an heterogeneous and debilitating and chronic disease that has a huge impact um, on the life of the patients. So there are uh, many unmet needs in the field of endometriosis, but one of those is, is really to understand uh, at the most fundamental level how endometriosis happens and what are the drivers. So we believe that uh, by providing um, the single cell, uh, um, by bringing the single cell uh, assay and technology into this disease, we can really support on uh, um, further developing diagnostic um, method biomarkers and new drug developments. So <clears throat> a little bit about endometriosis uh, disease itself. Um, it's, uh, it is defined by the presence of endometrium-like uh, tissue that grows outside of a uterine cavity. So the endometrium is, is the lining of a uterus. Um, and endometriosis uh, lesions can be found most commonly within the pelvic area. They are uh, normally defined uh, or categorized into three um, type of lesions. The ones that will be superficial uh, and in the peritoneum, so superficial peritoneal lesions. The other type of lesion that um, uh, is specifically located in the ovary is called the endometri um, ovarian uh, endometriosis or endometrioma and form this very specific chocolate cyst-like uh, um, uh, uh, lesions on the ovaries. And finally, you can find lesions that really can invade, uh, deeply invade the organs and are la uh, labeled as deep infiltrating uh, endometriosis lesion. Um, but endometriosis uh, surprisingly can also be found outside of the pelvic cavity. And regarding the etiology of this disease, it's still really under debate. And what we have at this point, it's mostly theories. So um, the ectopic uh, dissemination of uh, the uh, uterine endometrial cells is believed to be the most likely explanation uh, for endometriosis and is named uh, retrograde menstruation. So um, during this retrograde menstruation, uh, what is stated is that the uh, menstrual effluent will uh, travels back through the fallopian tube and bring some uh, pieces of tissue of cells that will be able to seed within the pelvic cavity and 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 allows uh, uh, to form those lesions that said uh, that it's an explanation that doesn't fit all the nuances of the disease because we can also find uh, endometriosis lesions outside of the pelvic cavity in uh, pretty much every organ the lung, the brain uh, the liver so 
And also endometrial uh, menstruation really happens uh, um, broadly. It's been uh, shown to happen in more than 90% of uh, female. So it really doesn't explain uh, all um, the diversity of the lesions. Uh, as well, the pathobiology of the endometriosis is really uh, um, unknown. And at this point, we don't really have a, a good understanding of how those lesions arise and how they evolve or even recur. So what we propose is um, to, to use single, a single cell approach to understand better the, the complexity and the diversity of endometriosis. So for that, we recruited patients uh, uh, from um, diagnosed with uh, very severe uh, endometriosis or stage three and fourth uh, revised SRM classification. And we collected two types of lesions, the ones from the ovary and another, uh, the other type of lesion that is the peritoneal superficial lesion. Uh, we divided this last one into two different areas, the lesion itself and the adjacent tissue. And finally, we collected the utopic endometrium from both uh, uh, the endometriosis patient and from the control uh, cohort that was diagnosed endometriosis rate. And to complement this single cell approach, uh, we also use a single cell omic, um, really to understand uh, what are the constituent cell type and their transcriptomic signature, but also what is the orga organization and the spatial characteristic of those cells. Um, and most of this has been uh, published uh, in this publication. Um, so the, the first thing is um, you can do many things with single cells, but what we wanted to do is really to understand um, in a holistic way the composition of those uh, tissues. So the first point was really to understand how much our single cell suspension uh, reflected uh, the original tissue composition. So for that, we perform bulk RNA stick that we, com we compare to um, uh, the cell, cell suspension of a pseudo bulk uh, single cell RNA seq and really uh, identify the missing cell types that were not um, um, present in the in the single cell suspension. So as expected, some neuronal projection adipocyte or muscle cells were not in our um, in our uh, data set. We uh, collected a total of 122,000 single cells across uh, 16 individuals in 30 samples and identified the major uh, cell type. That allowed us to uh, um, study the cellular proportion of those different tissues that we collected from both the control um, endometrium and the endometriosis endometrium, but also to compare uh, two different types of lesions. And what we found is that we indeed had um, uh, differences in the cellular composition between the different tissues, but also within the lesions uh, themselves. Um, further uh, um, uh, digging into the, the identity of those uh, cell major cell types, we subclustered um, uh, those uh, um, uh, major cell types, and we identified fifty-eight cell superpopulation. And uh, in addition, we define a specific marker for it, most of them, and use IMC to identify uh, where those cells were actually uh, located. So. Um, Macrophages are very critical mediator of the microenvironment, and they participate in multiple aspects of the tissue immunity and, and, and homostasis. And macrophages at Eurogenia has been described in many of its uh, uh, chronic inflammatory disorder or cancer, and they've been also shown to play a critical role in endometriosis and its microenvironment. So we detected five different subtypes of uh, uh, subpopulation of macrophages, and uh, some of them that were very specific to the peritoneum, such as uh, peritoneal macrophages. But one was that that was that was interesting was the um, the one that expressed uh, live one, and we found an, an expression an increased expression live one uh, really specific um, to the uh, epithelial. Uh, uh, per Sorry, endometriosis lesions. Um, in addition, within this subcluster, we could find an increased expression of uh, genes that were related to uh, um, tolerogenesis, so uh, immunosuppression, such as IL-10 or the SIG4, but also genes that were linked to uh, a pro-angiogenic phenotype. As well, um, IGF-1 and EMB that have been already shown to uh, induce neurogenesis in endometriosis lesions were particularly enriched in this uh, subpopulation. 
Um, so previous studies have shown that uh, those macrophages play a role um, in wound healing and tissue repair, and they can be found uh, uh, close to the vascular structures. So we went back to our IMC um, panel and really tried to locate those live one expressing macrophages and indeed find that they, they, they locate really close to the um, vascular cells here labeled with CD31 and a corporin one. So we, we wanted to see a little bit more how do the how the tissue organized and by by looking into uh, the different subtypes that we uh, identify for single cells and locating them through IMC, we really found some interesting um, um, immune um, interaction and in particular the aggregation and the um, uh, the recruitment of uh, immune cell around vascular structure seems to be uh, really uh, predominant uh, in the peritoneal lesions. So one of the uh, subtype that uh, is important for vascular structures are the mural cells and the perivascular cells. And in particular, we um, located one perivascular cell that we named CCN19 um, that was predominant in peritoneal lesion and also had an increased expression of uh, CCN19 um, gene. But not only, uh, FGF7 and uh, CCL21 also were shown to be uh, specifically upregulated in the peritoneal lesion not in the ovarian, and uh, those genes, ha genes have been uh, linked to the recruitment of T cells. As well, when you look at uh, the partner of those mural cells, but are the endothelial, uh, um, the vascular endothelial cells, we could see some genes related to the uh, um, immunoattraction uh, um, of um, immune cells, such as uh, cell uh, genes implicated in cell adhesion, but also genes that were uh, linked to permeability of those, uh, the vascular um, structure that were specifically increased in those lesions. So uh, we confirmed that uh, with IMC. So another uh, important point is um, how we can uh, really dig into uh, the, the, the spatial uh, location of a single cell of the cells when we identify them. And another one that was really uh, very important was um, uh, the B cells that are part of the, um, the lymphocyte subpopulation. And what we found when we uh, tried to locate them in the tissues that they organize in what looks like um, uh, germinal uh, centers or uh, tertiary lymphoid structures in the periphery of a, of a peritoneal lesions. So the, the, it was very interesting because we found uh, the presence of uh, TLS-like structures only in the peritoneal lesions, not in the ovarian lesion. And what we don't know yet is what is the role of those TLS in endometriosis, how that correlates uh, with, for example, the age of a lesion or the morphology or the symptomatology. So this is... Um, uh, an, an area where we, we're trying to advance. Um, looking back into how we can distinguish if the immune cells that we detect uh, in those lesions are um, uh, infiltrated cells or they're just uh, or, or they're uh, originally found in the tissue, we look further into our single cell data set. So some of those clearly uh, express markers that indicate that they are blood derived. Um, and we definitely can find some endometriosis specific signature in those um, in those subtype. But um, the question is, what is the source of those uh, infiltrated immune cells and how do they uh, participate in shaping the niche and the phenotype of the uh, utopic and ectopic cells that will make the the, the the, the complex of the endometriosis uh, microenvironment. So thinking about the retrograde menstruation and how uh, those lesions arise, um, you could think about uh, the source of those immune cells being uh, the endometrium for the retrograde menstruation and the uh, menstrual effluent, or it could be also um, within the peritoneal fluid, that is the liquid that bathes uh, the pelvic cavity, or maybe just a through angiogenesis and recruitment of blood-derived cell immune cells that will infiltrate the lesions that we profiled. So for that, uh, we uh, collected additional samples uh, to really understand where we can find uh, cells that we are uh, locating within the lesions and carry endometriosis specific signature. And some of the samples that we profile now, uh, we are now providing our blood and peritoneal fluid, in addition to utopic endometrium. Um, so the first thing is really to try to uh, see what you're getting in uh, the peritoneal fluid and the endometrium. So we uh, cluster that, uh, we uh, 
uh, projected onto our uh, uh, single cell data set. And we obviously uh, found a lot of myeloid cells within the peritoneal fluid and a lot of lymphoid cells in the blood. And um, further projecting these um, um, subtypes, this ensemble of cells uh, in the subpopulation of myeloid and lymphoid cells, we, def we found some um, a presence of uh, immune um, uh, my myeloid cells uh, that can be found in the peritoneal fluid, um, both monocyte and infiltrated macrophages, but as well uh, a, a very interesting population uh, such as the peripheral NK cells that uh, also is present in the um, in the circulating blood. So uh, IMC uh, uh, really enables us to uh, get a, a single cell spatial integration of, uh, of, of the cells. However, this method is targeted and uh, it only enables to interrogate a limited amount of epitope at a time. So uh, using single cell um, spatial transcriptomics, that is a whole transcriptome method, we want to establish a deeper and just a phenotyping the spatial biology of the cells that we uh, identify. So for that, we used Visium, uh, that is a spatial transcriptomic, but this method, uh, despite being extremely powerful, has a huge drawback uh, that it's not single cell. So for that, uh, we use our single cell data set to define the transcriptome uh, of the signature that are present uh, in the spot uh, that will be covering a pool of uh, different cell types. And uh, using this signature, we can try to tease out uh, which combination of cells are present in the neighborhood and um, um, of some uh, spot. So, um, we apply that, and this is what we're looking into now about establishing um, uh, this complementary uh, spatial profiling of the, of the tissues and really understanding how the spatial uh, cellular organization um, um, can tell us more about the biology of endometriosis. So in summary, uh, we used a single cell omics to define endometriosis microenvironment by identifying the component uh, um, a cell type and the transcriptomic signature. We use a uh, single cell uh, um, omics, spatial omics, to understand the cellular organization and spatial characteristic, but also the cell-cell interaction. And we identify um, um, cell types or structures that we believe are important for the endometriosis microenvironment. And that has allowed us to identify um, uh, major uh, differences between peritoneal lesion and ovarian lesion, two, two different type of uh, endometrial lesion, but also common um, uh, uh, signatures such as an immunomodulatory microenvironment that seem to be um, um, uh, happening across the two uh, sample types. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone uh, in my group that has worked on this. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Elise, for walking us through that. A reminder, folks, please uh, enter your questions if you have them, if you'd like to ask in the Q&A box in Zoom. Um, let me get a um, start by asking maybe a, a, what might be more of an open-ended question that is really desirable. But um, you, I think Aaron and Elise in particular both talked about sort of these sort of multimodal approaches, whether it's spatial, single cell, attack seek and RNA seek, uh, site seek, how to, you know, uh, at least you showed IMC, which has also protein based level imaging mass cytometry. How do you think about when to use different approaches and especially in using multiomic approaches, what's the right, um, what are the considerations for, for doing that other than dollars? Um, yeah, I think it, it all really depends on the question that you uh, that you're addressing. In our case, what we really wanted to do is uh, to have a fundamental understanding of um, of a cellular composition and the spatial organization. So we uh, we try to use uh, single cell technologies when available. Um, I think uh, the single cell spatial transcriptomics is definitely something we're going to be um, uh, looking into. That said. Uh, I think I concur with Beth, and it's important to have a representative cell type, a cell number that can uh, really allows you to draw conclusions. So it's important to be able to uh, use the single cell high throughput uh, approaches to be able to sample as many um, tissues as you can to have enough cells per cluster, to have robust conclusions, and to also identify uh, the ones that you can you you can I, you can profile for single cell droplet based method, for example, and use complementary special approaches. Um, 
All right. Yeah, there's sort of a philosophical answer and a practical answer to your question. I mean, on one hand, uh, surface proteins, gene expression, chromatin accessibility are all things that point to the, a cell state, and they can all be thought of proxies for measurement of cell state. Of course, they're also different. And so what is the different information that you get uh, when you probe surface protein composition versus gene expression versus sort of regulatory epigenetic state? And I think that, um, so, 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 you know, to Elise's point, it really depends on what kind of question you're asking. And I think that in some cases, it's, it's very much a pragmatic question. If you can identify the popular, if you care about changes in cellular composition, and you can identify the populations you care about with a handful of surface markers, then maybe that's sufficient to look at how, you know, a change in CD4 uh, or CD8 or Tregs, you know, respond to a certain disease. But if you want to understand, for example, how the accessibility profile in a precursor state might implicate, you know, a differential, a differentiation pathway to a, to a terminal state, you might need a combination of a taxi and surface proteins or, or, or gene expression to see how the relationship between the regulatory state and the gene expression. Um, and in some cases, if you have, if, if you're dealing with nuclei, um, you know, then you can't get surface proteins. In some cases, if you want um, accessibility, chromatin accessibility, then you have to only, and, and you also want gene expression, then you can only work with nuclear RNA. And so a lot of it's limited by the sample or, or, or the sample processing. Thanks. We have a question for Beth about uh, when do you use DEPC and how how does that work in the overall workflow? Yeah, so the way we use it, so you have to remember, so DEPC is um, only ha has a really short half-life and aqueous solution. So we tend to add it and, and it's also um, broken down um, if it's a like a TRIS-based solution. So we actually put it in just in the lysis buffer and so we'll add it after we've like mixed up our lysis buffer, it'll be the last thing that we add. We add it right before we add it to the cells that we like. And um, yeah, and we have to do this in the hood because DPC is not the, the best chemical to be breathing in. Um, but then like after that lysis and the first washes that you have of the nuclei, then we don't use it at all. And we have no other RNAs inhibitors beyond that first bath in, in DPC. And, um, because it's like once once the RNAs are knocked out, they're not going to come back. Hopefully that helps answer that question. That's great. Thank you very much. That's great. You guys have questions for each other? Um, actually, do have you found that it's in um, that you uh, you can? Is there any value on using uh, DEPC when you have a single cell suspension as opposed to nuclei? Um, we have used it with cells. Um, I tend to be the only, the only thing I worry is that I, I'm not quite certain the DPC is getting into the cells. So if the cells break down, maybe they're releasing RNAs at a later point. Um, whereas with nuclei, I know like all the, all the, the RNAs have been like released into the supernatant. Um, and so that any, anything that's there will get knocked out by the DPC. But if it's in a cell, I'm not quite certain that they're getting um, knocked out by the DPC, um, but that's something for sure to try. But we definitely still use it um, when we use whole cells. Aaron, I also have a question for Beth. Uh, doing single nuclei RNA seq, you're sequencing RNA that's nascent, that's in the nucleus. So you're, you're not getting any of the cytoplasmic RNA. Um, but it, it's also, you know, comprehensive you know, measurement of, of gene expression. When you think about comparing doing sequencing the RNA in a nucleus compared to a whole cell, there's it's a subset of RNA molecules. So, do you think that you can you you should sequence less per nuclei because there's not as much to get, or do you think you should sequence more so that you can get more transcripts from the cell? Well, we definitely want to get as many transcripts per cell as we can get, and in fact, so like in the data set we, that we have. We still haven't hit like the maximum number of transcripts that we can get of the nuclei. We kind of we kind of waited until we had we sequenced until we had a 50% duplication rate in the sequencing. And um, 
and so after that it's kind of diminishing returns whether or yeah not. i guess that was my question like how do you know how much to sequence when you just have nuclei yeah we use that kind of 50 percent duplication 50%. threshold all right, we're at the top of the hour. Thanks very much to all three of you for your for your great talks. If participants have questions that you didn't get a chance to get answered, email us at tdcc at jax.org, tdcc at jax.org, and we'll get the, uh, uh, pass those along to our speakers. Thanks very much for joining us today. If you'd like to join us again on Thursday afternoon, please visit our website, genometdcc.org. Thanks so much, everyone, and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you.